Well, all, let's see, let me rephrase that. We use steel pipes, stainless steel pipes, to gather the hot glass on from the furnace. When the glass is hot and the steel is hot, they have a, uh, they bond to each other. They'll actually stick to each other when they're warm. The, both the glass and the steel get very hot in this process of glass blowing. The steel actually expands more than the glass does so that when it cools, it actually shrinks back and literally sends the hot glass flying. We preheat up the steel in the pipe warmer, pull it out, and get ready to gather the hot glass from the furnace. The temperature in the furnace is 2,065 degrees Fahrenheit. It has the consistency of hot, of warm honey. I'll actually let the glass flow off the end of the pipe before I roll into the colors of glass. These are crystals of glass that are the same expansion and contraction rate as the base glass. Heat and gravity are the two most important things in glass blowing. When we put it inside the fire like this, all the small chunks of color melt into the surface of the glass. It essentially creates layers of color. I'll put a second coat on to make sure that we have uniform and even consistency throughout the coloring. We have to roll inside the fire to keep things on center. The hotter the glass is, if you stop, the piece will actually drop and become out of round. As the glass gets hotter and hotter, it becomes more important to make sure that your piece remains on the end of the pipe. All of those colors have now melted in. I'm going to pull it out of the fire and roll on the hot steel right here. This allows the glass to move off the end of the pipe to the forward start of it. The only glass we're going to be able to use is the glass that's in front of the steel. Anything that's on the steel stays on the steel. It sure makes a difference without the fan on in terms of how hot things are. inside the studio. Alrighty, so I'm going to pull this out of the fire and I'm going to blow into the end of the blowpipe. The amount of pressure I use is only about one pound, maybe two pounds of pressure. But I put my thumb over it and I keep the pipe rolling and my air that's trapped inside this pipe is started to expand into the hot glass to create a bubble. And there it is right there. Now because the glass is hot, we don't see the orange the way the orange is going to be when it's cool. We have to roll to keep it on center. If we stop, the piece will drop and move itself out of being round. What this does, this starter bubble, it allows us to go ahead, just like in a rubber balloon, when you blow on a balloon, your first breath is difficult to fill and to expand into it, but subsequent breaths of air to blow up your rubber balloon become much easier, and the glass behaves the same way. The second coat of color, the second coat of glass that we put on will be much, much easier to blow up into the shape that we need.
I'll roll in to put a second coat on. I do what's called a strip gather where the glass is actually allowed to fall off the end of the pipe. And then I'll hold it up slightly to allow it to fall back so that it's coated that solid, or not solid, but that uh, blowing um, bubble inside there. So as I roll, the glass has become very, very hot. All of that clear 2,000 degree glass on the outside of that bubble has softened everything all up inside. The way I get air into the pipe is as I'll use, when I'm, when I'm working on it, is as I'll use a rubber hose like this and blow very gently. We use blocks of wood to shape the bubble up. I'm holding it down like this to allow gravity to stretch out the area close to the steel. And from here, we're going to go back inside the fire to change the shape into a nice cone shape, a conical shape. The cone shape for us is the same shape as this optic mold here. When we get the glass very, very hot and we blow into it, it will create a uh, sharp ridges of, of color and sharp ridges of, uh, of glass to help define and create the definition for the pumpkin. So now that we have our cone shape, we go back into the fire, we go back into the fire to get this very, very hot. We always have to keep it rotating or at least be conscious that it doesn't fall too far out of round. Sometimes we can hold it as if we were holding a fish by its tail and allowing it to flop back and forth. Sometimes that's easier than keeping it moving all the time. So I'm going to go ahead and bring this out of the fire and drop it down into the mold. I'll blow hard to shape this up. Here we go. I'll cut the tip off. Blow the piece up. Use the jacks to separate the glass from the steel or start the process. This reheat gives us a chance to use this, the jacks to separate the glass from the steel. As I pull it forward, I can blow into it. When I hold it up here like this, the weight of the pumpkin is falling onto the pulled point pushing itself up and creating a nice flat bottom underneath for the pumpkin to sit on. This is important to make sure, otherwise it would end up as a ball and that would never sit right on a table or anywhere else flat. So 
So there's still a lot of heat trapped inside here, inside the jack line. We need to be able to keep control of that and keep the bottom of the pumpkin perpendicular to the end of the pipe. For now, I'm going to start a stem, so I'll hang this up. and start the process to get the green together for the stem. It's important to keep the body warm so that we don't lose too much temperature. So I'm doing two things at once. I'm warming up the, the body of the pumpkin and I'm actually allowing the glass to cool for the stem. This means the, the next time I go inside to gather again for the glass for the stem, I'll be able to gather more material to make a bigger, better stem. Now that I put my second coat on there, this glass will come off smooth and even if I apply the color correctly. We pull the glass forward. The only glass, again, we're going to be able to use is the glass that's in front of the steel. So I'm chilling out the back of it so that we don't lose everything from there. I'll give this a quick flash. Preheat the body up again. this on the bench. And this is where I will attach the stem. Wrap the hot glass around the end of the rod, snip it off, lay it onto the top of the pumpkin, and that's all we've done there is we've actually just laid it on there. So we need to make sure that it is attached firmly to the body, and we do that by warming the whole pipe back up again and the pumpkin back up again just to make sure that that stem ends up being attached to the body of the pumpkin. The first thing in the fire is that top loop. The second thing, when you go to go out, I should say, let me rephrase that. The first thing in the fire is the loop. The last thing in the fire is the loop. It gets hot and we need to keep control of it while we work the other parts of the curls to make sure that those curls are attached to the body of the pumpkin. All the while I'm applying as much heat as I can to the jack line, the area in underneath here. What I'm looking for is movement and motion in the bottom of the pumpkin. If I can pry it with my tweezers to lift it up, it means that the glass is hot enough to be chilled out specifically where I want it to break off and separate from the steel. I think we're there. So I will return to the bench, use the jacks on the jack line, and then put a small drop of water on the jack line. From here, I'll take it over to the knockoff bench where we'll separate the glass from the steel. Little drop of water. And then when I take it over to the knockoff bench, what happens here is, is I put one drop of water onto the back and I hit it from down below 
And just like a piece of flat glass that's been scored with a, with a rolling glass knife, the fulcrum from smacking it from below breaks it from the top. So I fire polish, smooth out the glass, make sure all of that's tucked in, and then I take my maker's mark. Currently we're using a nice star. I'll preheat my steel stick up. Grab it by the top so that we don't, the warm steel doesn't crack the, uh, the stem. And here's where I go to put it inside the annealer to cool the glass slowly overnight. So from here, we put our tools back into position and get ready for the next pumpkin. There you go. That's the way you make a pumpkin. I'm sorry? Put the pumpkin into the so you this, this cat. The last uh -huh. cat. Can you do again about that? Do uh, you want to take that picture when yeah. we putting it in? Yeah. Okay, give it a moment. We need to bring it up to temperature and then um, I okay. can pick it up and then and then you can take it as I'm putting it in. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Right? Yeah, right? Thank so you. that way it's, it doesn't stay out. Yeah. If it stays out too long, it could crack and break. So we'll give it a moment. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a couple questions? Sir? Sure. What, uh, what, so like this, you know, Pumpkins are like a great fit for half a bed. Like, what do you do? You think this this business uh, could survive like another town up the up the road? Or, like, how did you the pumpkin pumpkins are incredible? Uh, yeah, oh, no. that's really that's a that's a great question. Pumpkins are one of those things that are highly collectible, and they are collected by people throughout the United States. So pumpkins are extremely collectible. There are multiple situations where re where glass artists put thousands of pumpkins on the ground and people come to buy from the glass pumpkin patches that occur everywhere on the East Coast, West Coast, and everywhere in between. So for us in Half Moon Bay here, there's a, there's a thought that it's, it's all about the pumpkins, but in reality, this is a very popular thing to do in a lot of places. What makes what I do here different is, is that I teach people how to make their own for essentially the same price as what they would buy or spend on one. So this gives them an opportunity to go ahead and make their own. And then it goes from a holiday seasonal decoration to personal art that they've got in their house or their home. Right. Phys physically, I mean, a pumpkin's a great shape to do this with compared to, you know, what I mean, aside from globes and or There's a variety of other, other things that we could make and we do offer other classes as well. But the pumpkin is a great way to learn the choreographed footwork that goes